Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, a show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Lauren, and I am here today with ICR research scientist and zoologist, Dr. Frank Sherwin. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Sherwin. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Lauren. So let's talk about light, not from the sun, not from a light bulb, but from living creatures. I'm, of course, referring to bioluminescence. Bioluminescence in the living world is utterly incredible. What we find is that God has created this ability to produce light in all sorts of living creatures, whether they're fungus on the forest floor or sharks in the deep ocean, they all can produce what we call this living light. And it has to do with a very special molecule that God has created called luciferin named after the angel of light, Lucifer, and an enzyme that helps to break down this luciferin called luciferase. Now, when luciferase and luciferin are combined, we have this liberation of light. And again, in all sorts of creatures, jellyfish, fireflies, (laughs) just a myriad of creatures. Wow, that's amazing. And that is not a word you use every day. What was that lucifer? Luciferin is the actual molecule, and a chunk of it is basically broken away by an enzyme that helps uh, biochemical reactions go faster, and that enzyme is called luciferase. And this happens repeatedly, very, very quickly, with the liberation of light, but it's very interesting because no heat is generated. Hmm. Now, that's a neat trick, if I can use that phrase, to produce all sorts of light in the living world without the generation of heat. And that helps uh, to protect the organism from overheating. So that's, that's good creative design and engineering. So is that specific mechanism of producing light, is that what constitutes bioluminescence? That's correct. That produces bioluminescence. And we find that bioluminescence occurs on land, that's terrestrial, but not very often. We find it in some, for example, some uh, fungus, some bacteria, and of course, everybody's favorite, the firefly or the lightning bug. And it's not really a good title because a lightning bug or firefly is neither. They're neither bugs nor flies. They're actually a beetle, a friendly beetle. Hmm. And they're found most of the time in the Midwest it, right when the sun is setting, you can see them flashing their lights as a display to uh, find a mate. And so this is a very amazing process. Now, this luciferin breaking down into uh, light by luciferase has been used throughout the centuries. As a matter of fact, even Japanese soldiers during World War II on these islands would take some of these bioluminescent insects crush them, and then read the battle maps by the light that was produced. Wow, I never knew that. So is it more of a chemical reaction, or how would you describe that? That's correct. It's it's what we call a biochemical reaction that God has created. And we look at the various animals where we find this fascinating biochemical process called bioluminescence, and we give glory to the Creator and not the creation. And so what we find when we look at this process of bioluminescence, whether it's on land, as I mentioned, but most of the bioluminescence is found in the oceans. And it's found in the area around 650 to 3,300 feet down in the depths of the ocean. Some oceanographers have actually seen that there is probably somewhere around 80 to even 90% of all the animals in this area of the ocean are bioluminescent to some extent. Uh, For example, we have bioluminescent jellyfish, we have uh, worms, uh, brittle stars, um, mollusks, uh, fish, all of these creatures uh, can undergo bioluminescence. That's amazing. So it sounds like On land, we have some creatures with bioluminescent capabilities. In the sea, we have a lot. And even in human history, they found some uses for that. But what is the purpose of bioluminescence in animals? Well, the purpose of bioluminescence is a number of things. They use it, for example, the insects use it for, we believe, you know, we can't interview the insect and ask them, why are you doing that? And so we think it's probably due to mating. Uh, it may be due to predation in some extent. There are some predaceous beetles that, that actually have the signal, the chemical signal that another 
firefly or lightning bug thinks is a mate, but it's actually a predatory beetle. And as soon as this individual flies to see what's up, they get devoured by this beetle. So there's various uh, functions of bioluminescence, including finding a mate, and including, uh, for example, camouflage. And this camouflage is uh, very, very fascinating. It's called counter-illumination. And this counter-illumination is due to special structures called photophores. And so we find that as far as zoologists can tell, as biologists can tell, that bioluminescence can proceed, for example, in finding a mate, in, uh, for example, uh, fending off potential predators and uh, other type functions that they're still investigating. But one thing is for sure, bioluminescence is beautiful and it reflects, if I can say that, the creator. So I know you've shared a couple of these with us already, but what are a few other examples of specific creatures that use bioluminescence? Good question. And most of these creatures are found, as we would mentioned, in the oceans. But one bioluminescent creature in particular is the ubiquitous jellyfish. About half of the species of jellyfish can undergo some kind of bioluminescence. Wow. So there's about 80 different species of uh, jellyfish that can undergo bioluminescence in the world's oceans. Uh, zoologists estimate, as I say, one out of every two. Every other jellyfish is bioluminescent. And it goes down to the great depths of the ocean all the way up to the surface. Hmm. So jellyfish like to migrate during a 24-hour period. As they come up to the surface of the ocean, they're undergoing bioluminescence, and that may be as a form of, of calling out for a mate, as it were, or to get food or any other number of reasons. But bioluminescent jellyfish are uh, really, really fascinating. And the most common and the most popular with people is the moon jellyfish. That can undergo some very fascinating type of bioluminescent properties. Uh, the most widespread of the mushrooms, looking at the terrestrial, the, the land, belong to the genus Arminalia. And this particular mushroom is, is a, a glowing type of a mushroom, bioluminescent, that populates the forests throughout North America and even into Asia. And so there's about 80 species of bioluminescent mushrooms throughout the world, and they're designed with this luciferin that you and I were talking about. Same thing that we find in the aquatic creatures, same thing that we find, for example, in fireflies. So this luciferin is found throughout this bioluminescent world. It's an interesting story. There was a biologist in Brazil about a century ago that was in the streets. Uh, it was almost dark. It was you, near twilight, and he saw some children playing with a ball, but this ball was, was glowing. And so he thought that was fascinating. And as he got closer, he realized it wasn't a glowing ball, but these children were playing with a bioluminescent fungus. And this wow. fungus is found throughout Brazil. And so that's, that was kind of an interesting story as I, I did research on this. Uh, there's three species of shark that undergo bioluminescence in, in the deep ocean. And two of the species are called lantern sharks, I think for good reason. And when you look at these lantern sharks, sharks, they have a soft, glowing blue patterns on their skin. Hmm. So I didn't know that uh, even sharks underwent a bioluminescent, not very many. And of course, the ocean is full of different species, but some of them are bioluminescent as well. So are these animals able to control their bioluminescence or does it just happen or? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, when they undergo a type of um, camouflage, they use what's called counter illumination. And this counter illumination is a fascinating process that helps to defend and, and to uh, make invisible almost a creature. And for example, the most common is the uh, deep sea fish that has rows of these photophores that glow and can do this counter illumination in a way of camouflaging themselves. Wow, so it's very intentional. 
are intentional, and it looks like the fish can actually control it. So these photophores are fascinating structures. Uh, they have various color filters. They have uh, reflectance, reflecting capabilities. They have all sorts of structures that are almost as complex as the vertebrate eye. And yet these are microscopic photophores that help to change the kinds of light that is produced. So we have detectors or sensors on the fish, and depending on the environment, they are able to change the ch color of these photophores. So in colder water, it's more blue. As the fish gets into warmer water, it becomes more green. And so this is a fascinating way they can control it. Photophores have a structure that is almost equivalent to the vertebrate eye. Uh, photophores have various color filters. They have something called reflectance all sorts of other structures associated with, with very sophisticated engineering, which requires a divine engineer. And so these are the photophores that are found, for example, in the fish, but there's also a type of bioluminescent algae as well. This algae is called the dinoflagellates, and the dinoflagellates are a protozoan algae and has two flagella coming off it. It's a single-celled creature. So the most common of the dinoflagellates are the algae that's responsible for producing light. And it gives bioluminescent beaches, it gives bioluminescent waves, and even bioluminescent caves on occasion, all due to this dinoflagellate, this protozoan parasite. So they produce a flash of blue-green light whenever the water that they're in is disturbed. Hmm. It can be disturbed by, for example, dolphins, a person swimming, or the propeller of a ship will give a, a uh, bioluminescent wake behind the ship of all these disturbed dinoflagellates that are producing this light. An interesting headline occurred in March of 2022, of all places, San Diego. And let me read to you this headline. It says, Bioluminescence is back at San Diego beaches, and dolphins are enjoying the blue waves. <laughs> then the subheading says, Get to the San Diego beaches before the electric blue waves are gone. And these electric blue waves are the dinoflagellates. And so the last time that San Diego beaches had these dinoflagellates illuminating the area was two years ago in 2020. And so it's nobody's sure as to why these, these blooms of these dinoflagellates occur and then you don't see anything for maybe a year. It may be due to just the right concentration of nutrients, the pH of the water, the oxygen versus carbon dioxide content of the water. All of that may help to contribute towards this dinoflagellate bloom. But it really is a fascinating process. That's amazing that God has programmed these bioluminescent organisms to respond in such specific ways to the things that are happening around them. That's amazing. And those are some great examples of that. So with all of this in mind, where do secular scientists believe that bioluminescence comes from? And what would your response to that be? Well, they have no choice but to give a secular, naturalistic, materialistic explanation for something as incredible as the ability of these creatures to undergo bioluminescence. So we would point to the creator and say, God has created these varieties of creatures, whether they're mushrooms or sharks or anything in between, the ability to bioluminesce. However, the secular scientist has to maintain that each example of bioluminescence would have to occur separately, individually. So some evolutionists are saying over 60 different evolutionary processes produced bioluminescence. Some would say no, over 90 examples of slow and gradual evolution by time and chance produced uh, this bioluminescence, but 90 times in a different environment. That kind of stretches it. I cannot see, as a zoologist, how bioluminescence can occur just once. 
through time and chance and natural processes, but the evolutionists say it happened over and over again. And that doesn't sit well scientifically. There's simply no way to explain something like that. Especially when such different organisms have a similar mechanism working inside of them to accomplish this. Exactly. And they use the same luciferin and luciferase. We can see God using the same tools to implement and to incorporate into these various kinds of creatures. Wow, that is incredible. We have an incredible creator. And specifically, you've touched on this, but specifically, how do you think bioluminescence points to our creator? Well, not only is it a very sophisticated biochemical reaction, which pushes against this evolutionary idea of time and chance and natural processes, but it does reflect, if I can use that word, the creative design and organization that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1 when he says that God's creation is not only seen, but it's clearly seen. And so we find these creatures release light, but no heat, as I'd mentioned earlier. And this is not only efficient, but the organism doesn't overheat in the what we call the oxidizing process. And so when luciferin uh, is affected by luciferase, the enzyme, it's an oxidation event. It should produce heat, but it doesn't. And that's, I think, uh, points to evidence of creation and design. I think it's interesting, speaking of creation, that the founding fathers of chemistry, one of the founding fathers of chemistry was Sir Robert Boyle, who, who lived uh, centuries ago. He was a creation scientist. He loved the Lord. And he showed that oxygen, since this is an oxidizing event, he found that oxygen was involved in bioluminescence with the brief work that he did with glowworms right there in England. And so it's the creation scientist, Sir Robert Boyle, who, who did some of the pioneering investigation and research into this bioluminescence. Wow, we have an incredible creator. And like you said, his awesomeness, his power and creativity is displayed in part in these bioluminescent organisms. So this is just fascinating stuff. Thank you for sharing with us today. I appreciate your being here. And to all of our guests, thank you again for joining us today on the Creation Podcast. You can access the Creation Podcast anywhere you usually access your podcast, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere else you usually go. Again, I'm your host, Lauren. We'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast. <laughs>